Hi guys, hey, how's it going? You're listening to the Dog Behind the Human podcast with me, your host, the Coach Francis. This podcast is brought to you by Podcast Network Asia, and we are powered by Podmetrics. Today, we're going to be talking to our fellow trainer all the way from Alberta, Canada. All right, so we've spoken to trainers from uh, the UK. London, to be precise. Um, we've spoken with uh, trainers from Australia, from uh, the U.S., of course, different parts of the U.S. And today, we're going to have a Canadian trainer. So how cool is that? And it's going to be first in the show. All right. So um, before we call on our guest, I'd like to introduce you. I'll talk about what he does. So he is a uh, dog trainer, uh, like I said, in Alberta, and he is the owner and trainer for Harmonious State Canine Enrichment Center. And well, um, he has a really good uh, educational background when it comes to dog training. So well, without further ado, let's call on our guest for today, Angel Rowe. Angel, hello. Hey Rocky, how's it going? Doing really, really good. <laughs> All right. So Angel just called me Rocky. Rocky is my corporate name, sort of like a nickname that I used when I was working in my uh, corporate uh, world before I become a dog trainer. But you can call me Francis, at least for the show. <laughs> so, um, okay. So Angel, um, can you please, um, well, tell us something about yourself. Let uh, our listeners know who you are. Well, I'm a professional canine trainer. Um, I own my own dog training company, and I've worked with quite a few others in the area. I've helped create a few programs for uh, dog daycares in the area as well. Um, my spouse and I breed and show American Staffordshire Terriers, and uh, mm. dogs pretty much are our life no matter where we go. All right, so before coming into the dog training world, did you start off with uh, another job or did you just start off from the bat? Uh, hey, I want to be a dog trainer. Uh, I knew when I was a kid, I wanted to work with animals, but schooling is really expensive here. So I actually used to work on the rigs and in the oil field while I was going to mm. school and getting some of my credentials to be a dog trainer. Wow. Well, that's, uh, that's really cool. Anyway, so congratulations you became a dog trainer that's uh probably your dream job and now you have it and i've been looking at your profile it's uh quite extensive um and there are some similarities about the programs that we took and studied like uh do more with your dog quite familiar with, with the program uh you're a member of the pet professionals guild and uh, also took up the um uh, some courses in diagnostics which i also took so i'm just really excited to see a fellow, fellow dog trainer who took the same course as I did. And it's just really exciting. So my question is, when you started listening to, well, started to be studying, okay, started studying to be a dog trainer, um, did you start off using positive reinforcement or like most other trainers, uh, we have to go through the painful journey of learning what an alpha is trying to be dominant and follow the leader or pack leader starts. So How did you um, start? Um, fortunately, I had some bad mentors that got me into the dog training world. Um, and I fell for the whole TV scheme of like the Caesar Malones and Brad Pattisons and those famous trainers. Uh, and then I found out who Dr. Ian Dunbar was and fell in love with his work. And that's what started sparking me into more of the force free uh, after that, I found Dognostics and the Pet Professionals Guild and fell in love with learning how to train dogs force-free. The other side of that was I got into dog sports, and you have to do those in a force-free manner. So it forced mm -hmm. me to have to change my training methods. And even to this day, I compete in dog sports, and I, I love them. I think that they are the greatest thing out there. The dogs love them too. So it definitely brings a different aspect of training when you have to change your routine into a more force-free method. Right. So how difficult was the change? Because um, like you, I also started 
using more of a punishment-based approach, like the use of chokers and those kind of stuff. And um, it was a big change. At first, it was really difficult for me because I have to unlearn the skills. Well, I never really unlearned it till there. I just prefer not to use it. Yeah. How was your journey uh, shifting from a more aversive to a more force-free dog-friendly way of training dogs? Mentally, super easy. I knew that trying to force a dog to do stuff was wrong right off the get-go, but I didn't know any other way. So I just figured maybe I wasn't educated enough. So when I started mm -hmm. learning the education, that really helped my mind just go, yeah, I was on the right path before. Physically, though, it was pretty difficult to unlearn the muscle memory of right. doing things like popping leashes or stuff like that. Like that took quite a while to get out of those habits. And unfortunately, my dog suffered that way because I practiced on my own dogs before I started working with client dogs and before I was confident going, you know what, these are how we can do this without having to pop that leash or get really in their space and everything like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I understand it's it, once you get into that habit of just popping the leash, it's really quite hard, if, especially if you've been tutored in using like the Caesar Milan type of correction, like doing that thing. Right. So that is something that's a little bit hard to remove. But again, if you really want to focus on science of training dogs, using positive reinforcement is the way to go. All right. So um, I'm looking at your credentials here. Again, you're also a stunt dog judge. Yeah. So tell me about that. Um, so similar to like the trick dogs that do more with your dogs has they actually have the next level up where you have to have certain levels of the trick dog in order to go into stunt dogs and it's performance based so mm -hmm. there's they want you to be flashy to the crowd and show off your dog and what it actually is is it's about the performance and some tricks and obedience skills with your dog so like novice it's it's a nice entry level. If you have your novice trick dog, you could hop in and do it. And you literally are just going into the ring, doing a little bit on the pedestal, some stuff on the marked pad because there's a marking target. You get your dog to sit, stay while you walk around in there. You perform a trick. You do a little bit with some hoops and then you flash the crowd as you exit and you get judged on how well that performance was and how much it enticed the audience to like you, right? Mm -hmm, mm hmm have you tried to join the the competition of a stunt dog before becoming a judge? Have uh, you tried to, um, trying to be a contestant? Uh, so I have all my nov like I have my trick dog things. I didn't get to a stunt dog competition beforehand. I was able to take the course and I was planning on going to one actually this year and now with flights and everything being canceled, it's become a little more tricky. Um, I have got to thankfully be a judge, though, and witness a few of my own students do their stunt dog things and actually get to witness it firsthand. So that in itself has been really exciting. Um, mm -hmm. And I am prepping my dog so that way I could enter in and do my own stunt dog stuff. I'm just in the middle of training right now for the level I'm working on. All right. That's super cool. All right. So another thing that you've listed on your um, well list of skills that you have here is the canine conditioning fitness coaching. So tell us more about that. What is canine conditioning fitness? So there are four levels of it. And what it actually goes over is a few different things. It goes over uh, stamina, strength, balance, it works on stretching and there's just different criteria for what your dog has to meet. So we work on and teach you how to do like static and dynamic stretches with your dogs, working different muscle groups and how to work those properly. Then we work on like balance. So getting them to work on uh, fit bones or peanuts and things like that, working the balance that they have and moving into like strength and conditioning. So things like weight pull or mushing or, uh, uh, running on treadmills or things like that. So it works your dog's body all the way around in a physical aspect, but it's something that any dog old or young can do because all the exercises can be altered. So that way, if you have an older dog with arthritis, they don't have to worry about doing, let's say the static stretches, but we can substitute it for like a hydrotherapy session. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. One thing that um, I'm really interested in is uh, mushing or sled pulling. Right. So if I was going to train, let's say I have a Siberian Husky puppy 
and I would want this dog to be a sled dog in the future. What's going to be the step in order for me to have this fit um, and conditioned dog that can pull? Well, it definitely starts from getting it from a good breeder or a good location first. You want to make sure that that dog is what you're looking for temperamentally and for what you want it to do for work before you start. After that, nutrition is going to be key as well. This dog's going to be running. You want them to be fit. So nutrition is going to play a really important role. Um, while they're puppies, you don't really want them pulling. So in that puppy stage, it's going to be a lot of conditioning, getting used to sounds, wearing the harness, having a little bit of stuff dragged behind them like ropes or water bottles, just making weird sounds in the proper harness, the uh, sledding harnesses that they wear, and then slowly working up to adding weight and adding an actual sled behind them and working on them listening to you while you're out there working with them. Uh, it takes a little while though, because definitely you don't want to start them too young while their growth plates are still developing and closing because you can cause issues with the growth plates developing wrong or muscle and ligament tears at a future date due to weakening them. So it takes a while mm -hmm. to get to a point where you can mush, but it's a fun journey on the way there because you get to build a really good relationship with your dog while you're training them. All right. Well, you mentioned two things that I'm really interested about and it's really close to me. One is getting it from the right breeder. And in your experience, how important is it for you to get a dog out of the bat, a really good dog from a really good parent, from a really good breeder? Uh, I think it's really important. You want this dog to be a part of your life and your family and to fit in with your lifestyle and your household. So you have to make sure you can sort of predict this dog's temperament to a little bit of a uh, background on its parents and lineage. So when you do go to a responsible breeder, for the most part, you can predict if that dog's going to have things like aggression or separation anxiety, or if they're going to be really smart and easy to train versus a dog who's a little bit more stubborn. You can kind of see that. Uh, genetically too, you could start ruling out health issues. So that's really important. You want this dog to be as healthy as it can to live with you as long as it can. But if you get a breed that's known for having hip problems, you probably don't want them to come and pull your sled for you, right? They're going to be more of a dog that you're going to do low level activities with. So if you want to get a dog that fits your lifestyle the best, going to a good breeder that you can talk to and guide you through the process and pretty much help you raise this puppy until the day it dies, because they will give you support through the dog's whole life, it's really important because it means that dog is more likely to stay in your home longer than you have an unsuspected behavior problem or go, I didn't sign up for this dog and get rid of it in the future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, well said. All right, the other point is nutrition. So we're talking about conditioning. So you mentioned nutrition. I'm really curious what kind of nutrition are we talking about? Are we talking about barf are we talking about raw are we talking about your kibbles i mean what is going to be the perfect um nutrition for you as a canine conditioning fitness coach for dogs so for myself i feed a primordial diet in my household we we spoiled our, our dogs a little bit um i'm a big fan of the raw diet it is the best overall for your dogs. It nutritionally can be very beneficial and it's better for their systems all around versus kibble, which tends to be more high in like fillers and carbohydrates and sugars and fats and things that your dog doesn't really need. Um, mm -hmm. And kibble can make or break your dog. Good nutrition really can make or break your dog. It can stop from having future health issues and it can prevent them from having things like DCM from having food that stops taurine production um, from becoming overweight or underweight or diabetic. It can kind of help prevent that a little bit and help your dog have a better future because they're going to be a lot healthier and stronger because the right food helps set them up for that. All right. So um, how, how is food and dog behavior or dog performance related? Um, does it affect them? Let's say, well, I'm trying to have a trick dog. Am I just going to go and give raw or do I use dog food? Um, how is it related in your experience? 
So I find more so food is more related to energy levels that you see in dogs. Um, if you feed food that's really high, like the grocery store type food, like kibbles and bits, lots of dye in it, everything like that. Those dogs tend to be a little bit more sluggish and they tend to eat more. And that causes a lot of residual effects on their body versus the dog who's got the better brand kibble that's more grain free or has the grains that they're supposed to have in it and more balanced they tend to be a lot more energetic and a lot more in shape versus the dog who's got to eat more and is out of shape because it's mostly fillers in their food behavior wise it can make a huge difference much like us if we ate mcdonald's every day that's a pretty popular restaurant here in canada you feel uh -huh. sluggish. Same here. Oh, you're foggy. Um, but when you eat fairly good and have salad and steaks and balanced meals, you feel a lot more energetic and your brain's a lot more clear. So you can focus a little bit better. And I'm sure that that mm. has the same exact effect on dogs. I know just seeing energy levels themselves on what a dog's willing to perform when they actually have the right nutrition versus a dog that's just pushing the performance because they need to, you see that difference and it tends to start right with nutrition. All right. All right. Good. All right. Um, dogs, how many dogs do you have currently angel? So presently we actually have six dogs, um, five of which are American Staffordshire Terriers and one is a Chihuahua. <laughs> all right. So th that's really interesting. Um, I, um, staffies, right? That's what they call them. Um, am the staff. American Staffordshire or am staff. Okay, so, um, why the am staff? What got you interested with this amazing dog breed? So, I actually fell into them. My fiance was breeding and showing them, and then when we got together, I kind of fell into her kennel and really fell in love with the breed. Um, they're just all around a really good companion dog. They're supposed to be a full out working dog. So we go and do things like scent detection, herding, trick dogs. We do uh, chase ability and uh, we do a combination of everything we can with our dogs and they will, they will go and work and do it because they love you and because they want you. And I love that in a dog. And then they also have this really good off switch. So you could sit on the couch and they just want to be a blanket and be on top of you. They just want to be close to you. Um, they're extremely smart and very, very loyal. And I think they're a very misunderstood breed. They get labeled in that pit bull umbrella and they really are nothing like a pit bull. They have a very different genetic makeup and a very different disposition about them versus uh, what a pit bull itself is labeled. All right. Can you please expand on that? Uh, what is the difference between an American Staffordshire Terrier and an American Pitbull? So they originally did come from the same line. Um, the Amstaffs were actually the throwback from pit fights. When they refused to fight, they went to the farmers. So the farmers bred in Bull Terrier, um, and there were two other breeds. You can actually look it up if you go to the AKC website and the CKC website. But they bred in a few other breeds and now they've created their own genetic makeup and they have a completely different temperament. Uh, most of them do not have dog aggression in them, though that still is a throwback gene and it does pop up here and there. Unfortunately, with every breed, you're always going to have that, right? But their body build is a little bit different, too. They come in three varieties. They come in a terrier, which is a little bit more streamlined, a, a bully, which is a little bit more thicker, and then a combination of the two, which is what we call a moderate. It's a cross between the terrier look and the bull look. So you get a bit of a thicker terrier to them. Um, mm -hmm. And again, they're supposed to be a working dog. So they are supposed to be able to go to the farm, herd your sheep, come into the house and play with your kids. So mm -hmm. being human aggressive is something that these dogs should never have in them. They're actually, it's right in the breed standard that they're not supposed to be human aggressive at all. And they're just a all around, very courageous companion. They will do anything you ask of them just to do it. And they're clowns about it. So they're always going to make you <laughs> laugh because, well, why not? <laughs> it's fun for them. So they get a laugh out of it. All right, I've had uh, the opportunity to train uh, quite a few American Staffordshires, and uh, we usually get a stigma from society, again, because of 
um, news reports because of some media reporting bad and ill about the breed. And they just say, whatever that dog is, it's still a pit bull. I mean, it's a dangerous dog. Yeah. What's your comment about that? I completely disagree. Um, that whole pit bull stigma, they've ramped in Rottweilers, bull mastiffs, boxers, anything with bricky heads, they call it pit bull now. And there are mm -hmm. definitely some hotter breeds out there. But to say that every one of those blocky headed breeds is a pit bull and that they're all aggressive or vicious, it's really unfair to the people that are actually putting the work in to make these dogs good for society. Um, I mean, you could walk in my house, my dogs would happily meet you and show you where the TV is so you could walk out with it. Like, they don't have a mean bone in the body. <laughs> All they care about is as long as you pay attention to them and give them a belly rub, they're good. You take what you want. Whereas the society mm -hmm. stigma, and I think some of this comes from so many crossbreed bully mutt mixes out there. Not that I have anything against them, but when you start crossbreeding, the temperaments become so unpredictable that you can't tell if that dog aggression is going to pop up again or not, or what temperament that dog's getting. And I think it's when we start getting those bully mutt mixes is where we start getting the stigma because a lot of those tend to hop the shelter system become more aggressive because of it or become very reactive and end up in the homes of these people that don't know how to deal with them or train them properly, which then creates this cycle of, well, the dog bit somebody or the dog's returned and it gets more aggressive and it just keeps falling out. And it's not really the dog's fault either. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And for the AM staff, which kind of family or lifestyle would you recommend this um, really powerful high prey drive uh, kind of breed? So they definitely are not for a first time owner. Um, you need to know what you're doing. When you have a little bit of knowledge, they fit in really well. They do really well with kids. They have a really good temperament to be around kids and family settings. They strive really well in family settings. In our last litter, we've only had two in the 10 years we've had the kennel. Uh, four mm -hmm. out of the seven ended up in homes with children and they are just thriving. They love having the kids around. All right. And how are staffies around other dogs? Let's say I, I'm interested. I'm mostly into golden retrievers and Labradors. Yeah. And um, let's say I'm going to take a staffy with me. So how are they with, um, with a family with existing dogs? Uh, again, as long as you go to a breeder who started the puppy off right, you shouldn't have any issues. We've had lots of our own dogs integrate in, and we know lots of breeders around the area that have had a lot of their puppies integrate in with other dogs, no issues. Um, even in our house, we've had dogs come in that are older that integrate in with our pack, no problem. They're fairly flexible in that sense. Um, again, it's if you go pick the right breeder and know your lineage, you can avoid the hassle of accidentally getting a dog aggressive dog or a hate and bringing that into your mm -hmm. home. Um, but so far, everybody that we've dealt with and a lot of people that we deal with, even client wise that end up with Amstaffs, they've integrated them in their home wonderfully. It just, again, a little bit of time, some desensitization and getting them used to their routine and they fit perfect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. There you go. So, for anybody who's thinking of getting an American Staffordshire Terrier, it's not really a bad dog breed. Actually, it's, there's no bad dog. It's really bad uh, breeding. It's uh, bad um, ownership or pet parenting. Or maybe you, you brought your dog to a bad trainer mm -hmm. using aversive stuff, which will then eventually make your dog into a ticking time bomb. <laughs> you agree, yeah. Angel? Oh, yeah, especially so even just speaking on AM staffs, we've seen it with some aversive trainers. You see the switch in them. You could tell when a good dog has dealt with a bad trainer because they do. They don't put up with stuff like that. They tend to meet it with aggression back to make the pain stop. So it's not mm. something I know in our breed specifically, it's not something you want to meet with aggression because they will become aggressive back to you. Wow. Wow. Well, we don't want that. All right. So, um, again, I'm really looking at your profile here, and uh, there's quite a few. But if you're going to choose a specialization in our industry of training dogs, what is your favorite? 
I've actually fallen in love with separation anxiety. I just took a course and just passed my certification. I'm just waiting for it from Julie um, Namesmith. Uh, she runs uh, sub-threshold training. So I took her mm -hmm. separation anxiety course for trainers. So now I'm an SA pro trainer. Um, it's similar to the CSAT training, but it's not a big name brand in that sense. And I fell mm -hmm. in love with it. Like I took the course really just to expand my knowledge so I could help my clients more. And I fell in love with it. And I've turned that into a bit of a niche market for myself here because I do enjoy seeing the progress that these dogs make going from being scared to be left alone to being able to be left alone and their owners being able to finally live their lives again. Right. Well, we do get a lot of those uh, cases from time to time with dogs um, having separation anxieties. Maybe you can try to educate um, our listeners and maybe I can also learn a thing or two from you. So um, maybe you can. we can start with one case and then how do we treat it? Um, can you give an example? Absolutely. So, I mean, the big thing is with separation anxiety dogs, it's fear. It's nothing that you actually did to your dog. Even as an owner, you didn't cause it. Uh, they found in research that it tends to stem from genetics and it's a fear-based behavior. You see it more in shelter dogs or dogs that are bumped around the system or come from puppy mills or aren't um, socialized at the critical age. You see it a lot in them. Um, and the big thing is, I guess for me, the understanding as an owner that it wasn't your fault. You hear that one so much. Well, I caused it because I stayed home or I did this. It's not your fault and you can fix it. The other one is like, you see it a lot. It's, it's the dogs you hear. Oh, my neighbor's telling me my dog is screaming when I have left the house, things like that. Get a camera. It's going to save your life in the long run. Because if you can pinpoint when your dog starts freaking out, you could see it. You can help them through it. You could start getting in, in with a proper trainer and start desensitizing your dog to you actually leaving. Um, because unfortunately, fear is one of those things we can't train it while they're in the middle of it. So we have to actually start by eliminating what they're scared of. So us leaving and training them to get ready for us to leave before we can ever leave the house. Uh, if we don't start off training them that it's okay with us leaving, we end up creating this cycle where they just panic and that panic becomes unbearable for them. So get a camera and pay attention to when those triggers start up and then give that to a trainer so they can help you out. Cause when they can see what your dog's doing, they can help you. All right. All right. So we're talking about separation anxiety and uh, the, my next question is about, well, basically what is the general of theory involved in trying to treat separation anxiety with uh with dogs and some trainers even call it separation distress right so uh, i'm going to be asking you about that but before you answer that we would like to um, um we would like our viewers and listeners to check our other podcasts available in podcast network asia and we do have a filipino uh, podcast called Matioria ng Pagkahulog. So you might want to listen to that and it says kay ganda ng panitikang sariling atin halikat pakinggan natin ang mga panukala ng mga mayakdang si Edgar Calabria Samar ukol sa panitikan at panunulat at ang interseksyon ng sining na ito sa pang araw-araw na buhay natin. Parang mas nahirapan pa ako dun sa Filipino. Okay, sige. And another show that you would want to probably listen to is uh, Parent Team. What's this about? Well, parents face many challenges. They have to make sure their child is happy and healthy. And on top of all that, take on work and household duties as well. If you're looking for advice to overcome these hurdles, come and listen to Parent Team. Hosted by Jelly Victor and JC Alelis, get to know the stories of real parents and how they step up to plate of parenthood. And of course, if you want to protect your finances or maybe you want to make investments, you should listen to First Metro Sec. 
the landscape of our economy is constantly changing, guys. So continue the learning process and listen to First Metro Sect, your weekly investing and trading podcast. Put hashtag your future first and get in the know about what the Philippine stock market has going on with First Metro Sect. There you go. All right. And back to the podcast with Angel Rowe. All right, Angel. So going back to the question, what are the techniques or theories that you usually apply in trying to solve separation on science? And again, there's a lot of dogs needing that kind of help. So uh, again, it's a systematic approach to desensitization that uh, we take with it. So we start by eliminating the fear. So you have to stay home or get a dog sitter to stay home with your dog. They unfortunately can't be left alone any longer because they will panic. And in that state of fear, they're not going to learn to not panic. Um, and then we just slowly start working them through. So there's a few games we play, like the door is a bore game where we start desensitizing you getting up, going to the door. Uh, we day we look at what their departure cues are. So if it's like grabbing your shoes or going and getting your keys, if those are the things triggering your dogs, we need to look at working those into the program to start desensitizing them so you can grab your shoes and put them on and your dog's not going to start panicking already. Um, because that's what your dog will do. They will start piecing together the pieces that, hey, when you grab your keys, grab your shoes, that means you're leaving, which means I'm going to panic because you're leaving the house and now I'm scared. So we start mm -hmm. looking backwards and slowly incorporating your life back in. The typical separation anxiety case can take anywhere from six months to a year to even just start making headway on it. So that way you could actually start getting your life back to normal. Uh, it's very similar to working with a human with fear issues. It can take a long time to get over it. So it, it takes a lot of teamwork and a lot of work from the owner to put in for the dog's sake. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You mentioned six months to a year. That's a very, very long time. So, uh, and usually it's the parents who give up first before the dog. What would you want to say to parents thinking my dog is useless or my dog is this, um, I, I can't do this anymore, they're losing hope. So what do you want to say to pet parents facing this kind of issues? Uh, be patient. It's, it's much like working with a kid or like when you learned a new skill at, a, at, at your job, it took time to learn that skill. It took time for your kid to learn their skills. It's going to take time for your dog to learn these new skills you're building up in it. If you just throw in the towel because it got a little hard, it, it's, not, it's not fair to the dog. It would be like as soon as it got a little tough in your new job or the new skill you were learning, you just quit because you failed at it a few times. You're, you wouldn't be where you are today if you wouldn't have kept fighting. So it's fair to the dog to keep working through it because it does get better. And it does get better. You just need to put that time in. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, uh, well, I do know the question to this, but maybe our listeners won't know. So, um, Angel, do you use treats in trying to solve um, separation anxiety? So that's where it gets a little bit difficult because the treats can actually become a poison reward to them where you're actually rewarding them in a fear-based behavior. So they're going to be more fearful and think that the rewards are good for them in that sense, right? So we don't want to give them rewards when they're panicking. And we don't really want to use this in the sense where how we desensitize a reactive dog to seeing other dogs, how we use treats to distract them and get them to focus on us again. This isn't the same way. This is more so we work with our dog and we praise them in other ways with our presence with, okay, we're going to stay with them an extra five minutes on the couch before we leave. Rewards like that go a lot further than trying to reward them with food when they have separation anxiety. Um, Part of that, too, is you see a lot of people who say use Kongs or bully sticks or bones when you leave your dog and it'll help with their separation anxiety. It can help, but it could also be 10 minutes of silence before half an hour more of panic. So it could just lessen the process of the panic instead of them starting as soon as you leave the door. So it's one of those things that really consult with your trainer about it, about where your dog is at and when the appropriate time to incorporate treats is. 
because it's not something where we want to reward them for panicking and stressing. We want to reward them for doing the right behaviors and being calm and being okay with us leaving them. Mm -hmm. All right. Wow. All right. So there you go. Separation anxiety. But you don't have to go through trying to fix something that is broken. If you start off with getting a puppy from a really good, reputable breeder, am I right, Angel? Oh, absolutely. I mean, even just speaking separation anxiety, there are programs out there like Puppy Culture or Abby Dog that breeders use. And I can tell you the night and day difference of a dog who's been on a Puppy Culture program to a dog who hasn't had a program. They are smarter. They work a lot more. They don't stress as much. The panic isn't there. And they're, they lack like that stress and fear that most dogs have because it's a socialization program. It sets them up so that way life isn't scary for them. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, again, we shifted a little bit to breeders <laughs> um, about how important it is getting um, dogs from reputable breeders. Uh, I'm just really curious because I've spoken to a lot of trainers in the UK and some other parts of the world and they're reporting the same thing. There is still puppy millers in their country. And my country, the Philippines, is no different. But how is the situation in Canada? Uh, Canada is actually pretty bad. We have a lot of puppy mills and backyard breeders. And then we actually have like our own little classification of retail rescues, um, which mm -hmm. are... Again, they're supporting the backyard breeders and puppy millers, which is causing this mass influx of dogs. And you could look at the bite rates, you could look at the statistics, and you could do the own research being a trainer, just looking at your clients. And you could kind of see where the problems are stemming from with the dogs bouncing the systems where they're more reactive or aggressive because they are so fear-based or the puppies that had a bad upbringing that you're finding out are going for like eye surgeries or they tore a muscle or this or that because they don't have good health lines behind them. So it's something that definitely in this day and age shouldn't exist anymore. Animals aren't a for-profit industry. They are they're companions for us. Uh, anybody who is a true breeder does not make money breeding dogs. We lose so much money and it's worth it. It's mm -hmm. a passion for us. We want to better our dog breeds. So we breed them to become better dogs. These backyard breeders breed four or five litters a year just to pay for their bills in their house and to make some money off of them and off of the unsuspected people that go, I just want a puppy now. Mm -hmm. All right. That's uh, pretty disturbing. So it's not just happening in our country, folks. It's happening around the world. And we probably need to just band together and then do something about this. Because as more backyard breeders and puppy millers make money out of this, it's really the dogs that's going to be suffering. And there's only so much for trainers like me and Angel here that can do for your dog because if they're really ruined well they might have to live their life in fear just because the genetics tells them to be really really fearful so anyway uh, i have a question here on our facebook live um coming from ja pantasila and he asked coach or maybe angel you can uh answer this how can you tell if your dog have a separation anxiety issue so separation anxiety could actually look like a lot of just bad behavior, you know, destruction, whining, barking, things like that. The big key difference is, and this is why I say get a camera. Do they do it when you're home and you're not looking? Because then that's not really separation anxiety. That's a dog that's going, I'm bored, I'm frustrated, do something with me, or hasn't been taught not to do that. But if they're doing it when you leave and they're continually doing it and don't calm down, you have a good chance that that dog has separation anxiety. If the panic mm -hmm. starts because you left the house or left the room and you could capture that on camera, you could start seeing whether they got a little bit upset and calmed down. You might have some mild separation related behaviors, but if it continues and it keeps escalating, it's because your dog's in a mode of fear and panic and you have separation anxiety. There you go. Hey, guys, you know what? I've been a trainer for a decade now, and I'm still learning so much from Angel here. So, um, again, Angel, thank you for being here. 
You know what? Um, here's something that I just saw on his uh, Harmonious State at CA website. Um, Angel Rowe is All Star Trainer of the Year title holder for Do More with Your Dog. Congratulations! When was this? Um, I achieved that January of this year. So in four and a half months of having my Trick Dog Instructor Certificate, I got my All Star Trainer of the Year designation. All right, that is so awesome, and he was able to accomplish this in just four months. Amazing. Um, that's titling a hundred dogs in tricks. All right, wow, that's a sounds a lot, a lot of work. <laughs> it's fun. Was it's it a fun. lot of work? Uh, it was a lot of time, definitely put in. But you know what? I enjoy any time spent watching my clients or working with them, so it doesn't feel like much time spent at all. Mm hmm. All right. All right. Um, maybe we can shift um, to that a little bit. How easy or hard, how hard is it to train uh, tricks to dog? Um, and then does it mean that you have to be breed specific as well? I mean, I can hear people like, hey, I have a Shih Tzu and I want my Shih Tzu to do this particular behavior that you usually see from a Border Collie or another um, Golden Retriever. So is it breed specific as well when it comes to choosing the dog uh, tricks that you want your dog to do not really no i mean it all comes down to how much effort you're willing to put into your dog uh, uh you could teach any dog to go and do tray ball and push a couple balls around it just takes that effort and the right trainer to show you how it's can be a little difficult if you're trying to teach a more difficult trick and your dog's really resisting. And that might just be a sign that your dog really isn't interested. And you might have to alter it a little bit to find something that works a little bit better with your dog. Uh, it, trick training in itself is actually really rewarding fun and it. It makes a stronger foundation and relationship between you and your dog. Basic obedience can only go so far and it is only so fun for your dog. So when you start adding in little things like do a spin, play dead, roll over. Uh, I love that they've incorporated things like rally and stuff into there. So it has quite a few different things that you can do for tricks. And then on top of that, it becomes really handy when you go out on walks. Because if you need to get your dog's focus, instead of just getting them to come to you and sit, you could get them to come to you and perform a trick and keep them occupied mm -hmm. with you. And it's not really breed specific. It's just, again, how much effort are you willing to put into teaching your dog that new behavior that's going to be odd to them at first? All right. There you go. Very insightful. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to some of the viewers watching right now. Well, we have Andre Lynn Vino Soriano. We have Darlene Tan Salazar. Thank you for watching and everybody else who's uh, watching the live stream. Thank you. This podcast is going to be available in partnership with Podcast Net Network Asia. And again, powered by Podmetrics, we are available on Spotify. You can also check this out on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and other podcast streaming platforms. There you go. So please follow and, uh, and don't miss an episode because I'm learning so much from this show, hosting, um, getting wonderful guests like Angel here. And this is the first and only podcast here in the Philippines. So good job to the team on Podcast Network Asia. Um, hopefully we get more viewers and listeners and grow our community here. All right. So now um, this is something um, that I'm really interested about is, well, the name of the show is The Dog Behind the Human. All right. So my question is, for each trainer, maybe for each person that has owned a dog, okay, there must be a dog that was behind the human. So that's my question for you, Angel. Who is that dog for you behind the human? I would have two specifically. Um, my chihuahua would be a big one. His name's Vanilla. He was my, well, he was the first dog that I wrecked using aversive methods. But he was also the first dog that I learned how to use positive and force-free methods with. And I got into the sports world with him, and him and I uh, 
did a total of 19 shows in the ring doing rally obedience and earning titles and ribbons and spent a season doing that. And then I retired him out of showing and he's just my little companion dog now, but he taught me a lot about changing my methods and having to work through that and work with him. Um, the other dog would be bomber who was actually the dog who brought me and my spouse together and uh, he taught me a lot about genetic dog aggression and taught me a lot about nutrients and how nutrition is so important because he actually ended up with a uh, DCM due to his food. And that's the reason oh. we ended up losing him is his heart became so enlarged. He ended up with the leaking valve syndrome. Um, but he made me a much better trainer because he taught me a lot about genetics, a lot about nutrition, and just a lot about handling a lot of dog. He was 84 pounds of pure muscle. So I had to become very creative in ways to handle him and be force free and keep him entertained and engaged with me. So those would definitely be the two dogs that have made my career so far and made it so much better as I've been progressing. All right. All right. So there you go. The dog behind the human for Angel Rao. We have another question here coming from Ian Lorenzo. And she says, as a breeder and trainer, how young can you see signs of separation anxiety on a puppy? So that really does depend on how much you pay attention to your puppies and what kind of protocol you go for. But you can start seeing signs of separation anxiety in dogs as young as six to eight weeks, depending on how soon you start doing things like separating them from the litter or their mom or each other doing crate training. Um, you will see those signs and that stress of separation anxiety when you start doing that. And if you are noticing it, it's a good sign to stop because they're not ready to start that kind of training yet. And to add in like little separation protocols into your breeding program where they do learn to be apart from each other for short little stints a day, even just a minute or two when they're at a young age can make the biggest difference as they grow up because they learn that being okay is not fearful. It's not scary. It's okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're almost running out of time. Um, however, I have a few more questions for our guest, Angel Rowe. Again, Angel Rowe is the owner for the Harmonious State um, business in Alberta, Canada. And he has an extensive um, profile, really, of about uh, training dogs. I mean, you can ask him almost any question, and I'm sure he has an answer for it. All right. So my next question is really about um, if I have somebody who wants to be a dog trainer, uh, what advice would you want to say to that person? Find a good mentor who uses science. <laughs> if they're discrediting science... <laughs> there and, you go, science. If they're discrediting science and saying things like, oh, no, it doesn't hurt, oh, there's no pain, stuff like that, run away. <laughs> they're going to mess your whole career up. Um, find accredited mm -hmm. schools, things like Dognostics, uh, the ISCP, IMDT. They have good schooling out there. Uh, Denise Fenzi and the Fenzi Academy. Uh, do more with your dogs. Anything that you can get your foot in to take courses, take courses, learn about it. But find a good mentor that's going to take you under their wing and let you actually get the hours in. The knowledge means nothing unless you know how to use it. There you go. Knowledge means nothing unless you know how to use it. I'm going to put that as a code. Well done. <laughs> All right. So I um, it's good, but you got to be able to think on the fly because they're going to change their behavior faster than you could change your reaction. So you got to know how to use that knowledge. All right. Well, we're talking about, again, we're supporting force free training. We're talking about science. And yet there is still a pushback. And I've asked the same question to other trainers. Why is it uh, there is still um, the other side of training wherein people still believe in being the pack leader and then people still refuse to just go on to positive because they think it's for or for wimps um, and it's not going to work. I mean, what what do you think about that? I think people are scared of change. Um, 
And it's that old school methodology. We've done it this way forever. So why would we change it now? Which is the worst way to go about it because science changes every day. Uh, the only way that you're, I think the only reason it really still exists is because marketing. Uh, they have better marketing. Look at the adopt, don't shop spree that's out there they have better marketing and when you market it you get the masses that don't want to do the education because they go well you're the professional without realizing that unfortunately it's an unregulated industry so anybody can be a professional and the credentials behind it don't matter to everybody uh, a lot of people don't see the worth in it yet it's similar to like, uh, I don't know there if hairstylists or groomers or stuff need to be credentialed, but I know for a long time, hairstylists in Canada, they had to fight to become a registered trade. And now that they're a registered trade, you can't do hair without a license. That that really mm. needs to happen in the world of dogs because they are, they're living, breathing creatures and you need to know how to react to their emotions, their behaviors, everything. It's like having a tiny furry human running around with teeth that that's the only way they can communicate to you is those teeth. So you need to know certain aspects of dog period in order to just coexist with them and marketing. It's the people like Cesar Milan who made the good movies. So he ended up on TV or Brad Pattison. He was drama. So he ended up on TV. Whereas the positive dog trainers, they're not drama because we don't want to stress the dogs out. We want to fix the dogs. We want to work with the owners. So we're really boring. We don't make for good TV. <laughs> right. I agree with that. I mean, people are looking for the juicy stuff. Like They're looking for the bite. They're looking for the correction. But we don't do that. We're really boring. <laughs> we are. I mean, if you're stressing the dog out to bite you, you've done something wrong. You've pushed a limit. You've gone too far. And any good trainer is going to know they went too far. They're not going to go, let's broadcast it on TV and call it good dog training. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. We have another question coming from uh, Myla. And she says, hello, coaches. Question, in the movies or cartoons, when dogs stay by the door all day waiting for the for the owner, is it called separation anxiety? Just curious. That one's tough. Um, I guess it really depends on what the dog's doing. In those shows like Pets Life where the dog just lays on its bed and watches the door all day, the dog's not really stressing that the owner's gone, so they're not panicking. I wouldn't call it separation anxiety. They just know that's the door the owner comes in and out of, so they stay there most of the day waiting for the owner to come back through the door they went out of. But if they're staying by the door and panicking, stress panting, whining lots, barking, pacing, things like that, that's a good sign that you have some separation related behaviors on your hand. All right. Awesome. Oh, wait. So while there's still so much more questions, I would probably want to ask uh, Angel here, but again, we're under time limit. So uh, maybe we are, we are going to be inviting Angel again once he's available and uh, maybe focus on some other stuff on what he does. All right. So, um, any final words, um, Angel, how can they get in touch with you? Let's say if we have uh, Filipinos or other listeners in Canada, how do they get in touch with Angel Rowe and Harmonious State? Absolutely. So first, thank you for having me. It's a great honor to be invited to something like this. So I greatly appreciate it. And the revolution for force-free dog trainers, you're going to be leading one of them. So I'm, I'm really, again, honored to be here with you. Um, to get a hold of me, you could get a hold of me on Facebook just by searching Harmonious State. It's going to pop up with a heart mm -hmm. as a dog mm -hmm. paw, and it's pretty obvious that that's a dog business. The other way would just be going to my website, HarmoniousState.ca, spelt just how it sounds, and you'll be able to get a hold of me directly from there or my phone number or go and read my bio and see everything about me on there. All right. Good stuff, Angel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Um, I hope to well, speak with you uh, again next time for another episode. I would love to come back. All right. Thank you so much. All right. So for everybody else who's been uh, watching the live stream, thank you so much. 
And if you're listening to the podcast, you can also reach us to our social media pages. All you have to do is check YouTube, check on Spotify. Uh, we have our Facebook, Instagram. We are everywhere. All you have to do is search Doug Coach Francis. And, well, there is so much more right after our interview with Angel Rowe. You have to check our Barking News. Again, it's going to be available on our Spotify once this is uploaded. So thank you, everybody, for joining us with this interview. And, again, this is your host, Doug Coach Francis. Don't forget to pet your dog. You have a good day. <laughs>